Hi there. In this next video, we will explore hypothesis testing for two means when dealing with dependent samples. This is what we refer to as matched pairs. In the previous video, we learned that you have to first verify if your data is independent or dependent, and that determines what type of test we perform. Now, the difference here is you're actually doing a comparison to measure what the difference is when your data is dependent as before, we weren't looking at the difference, but all of the information as a whole. So the first thing you always do is find the difference between each of your sets of information. Listed below are systolic blood pressure measurements taken from the right and left arms of the same woman. Using a 0.01 significance level to test for a difference between the measurements of the two arms, what might you conclude? Well, for starters here, because they specify these are coming from the same person, right, doesn't matter, I mean, at the end of the day, male or female, same person, you should end up with the same measurement in each arm. We have our right arm and our left arm, so it looks like two samples, but we want to measure to see is there any difference at all. Again, there should not be a difference if you're measuring the blood pressure regardless of the arm it comes from. So what I'm going to do here is first add a row at the bottom, and calculate the difference across the board. Right arm minus left arm each time. The first one gives us negative 73, the second negative 68, the third negative 88, negative 67, and negative 65. This is something that can be done using your graphing calculator in a very simple fashion. And I'll show that in the next example. Next, set up your null and alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that the mean of those differences is equal to zero. In other words, when you add all of these up and divide by how many you have, that number should equal zero. The alternative hypothesis is that the mean is what exactly? We're trying to test that there is no difference so that the mean is not equal to z zero to verify what happens. Now, for something like this, because we've consolidated our two sets of data into the differences instead, you want to take a look at what the mean of the differences is. So this is something, again, you can do in the calculator. Uh, find X bar and your sample standard deviation. And then, because it's only one list of information, when your data is dependent, you're going to go ahead and use a singular t-test for something like this. So take a moment and run those calculations. Now. Upon using the list here, I'm going to show you how we calculated the differences from here, or you could do straight subtraction. If you highlight up, you're going to take your first list and subtract the second list. So we have this information in list 4. I'm going to say subtract list 5 from that. And it will populate all of that information we found here for us. Now everything we do is in reference to that list of information. So when you go into your t-test, again, it's now one set of information under list 6. I'm going to select a regular t-test. And since we have it in list 6, I'm going to select data. Our mu is that the differences are equal to 0. That's what we're verifying here. And we're referencing this to list 6. We want to see if there has been any change. Right? Is there a difference in these numbers? Now, before we even calculate here, you can see there's a very obvious difference. 102 to 175, 101 to 169. All of those numbers are fairly large, which should kind of spark up a little bit of something doesn't seem quite right. Upon calculation, we can see that we have a very, very extreme test result here. So from all of that that we found, remember it's a 0.01 significance level test. We have a t-score of negative 17.34, so it's our t-test, and a p-value of 0 0.000065. Our p-value is substantially smaller than alpha, so we can say that since p is smaller than alpha, we reject our null hypothesis, there is sufficient evidence that there is a difference in the blood pressure measurements 
in each arm. Now, this is where, like we said earlier, you have to use your common sense. Is it actually practical that we are getting different measurements and uh, that we're getting measurements that are so different that there is enough evidence for it? That's a problem. So what should we learn from this? We should learn, quite frankly, that in context, this is definitely fishy. So if something is not right, perhaps we need to retest. And by retest, I mean remeasure the results in each arm. For all you know, this could have been attributed to something like a faulty um, blood pressure cuff. Or maybe you had a different person calculating on each arm. And although it should be the same, it could be human error. There's really so much that could happen. So while based on the statistics, yeah, there is a problem here. The mean is not actually, the mean difference rather, is not actually what it should be, right? It should be pretty close to zero. But that tells us even more that either we had a problem with the way the measurements were taken in the first place, or for all we know, maybe you asked the person when they were rested to do one arm, and then they started to panic a little bit. They got nervous for the second arm or something like that. Maybe they were moving around. Maybe they took a walk. There are a bunch of factors that could go into that. So let's go ahead and do one more example. Now, for the sake of time, I've already gone in and entered all of our data into list one and list two for the Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix grossed, um, grossed amounts of money and also for Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. So this is already our list one and list two. Now, remember, when we're measuring pooled information, we first need to find the differences. So we're going to take list one and subtract list two. and populate there. So that means the list of our differences is holding all of that in three. So L3, again, has all the differences. Again, you could copy this down if you wanted, but it's really not necessary. So what are they asking us to test here? These are the, this is the amount of money that each of these films made for the first 10 days after release. And at a 0.05 significance level, test the claim that Half-Blood Prince did better at the box office. So our null hypothesis is still going to be that the mean of the differences is equal to zero, because if they did equally well, then their differences should all be about zero. And the alternative hypothesis is what exactly? So that the order of the phoenix did let's see, not as well as the Half-Blood Prince. So if you subtract these, that means their differences should be negative. In other words, Half-Blood Prince did better, so these are the bigger numbers. So that means mu d is actually less than zero. So we're testing to see if the differences are less than zero. Also using our t-test function, because we're now dealing with one set of information, that is the differences, we're going to test the differences in list three, and that these numbers are actually smaller than zero. So just so we have a source of input here. So based on this information, what exactly have we found? We have found our t-test and our p-value and we're testing this at a 0.05 significance level. So in this case, our p-value is very, very much bigger than alpha. So we would say that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, again, treat this in practical application. In the real world, now that it's been many years since these films have released, there's other ways to go about testing how well they've done other than just using a hypothesis test. So in practical ap application, you could look at across the board how much money did each of these films make while in theaters and just do a straight comparison in that way. Now, this in some aspects gives you the ability to do a comparison day by day by looking at the differences on each day. So the choice is yours how you'd like to, again, in practical application, investigate and interpret some of this information but kind of in a nitty-gritty way, you can use a hypothesis test for this. 
Now, to conclude this video, there's just a few words I want to say about inferences regarding confidence intervals in testing. If you want to use or construct a confidence interval for any of this information, you can use their respective confidence interval functions in the calculator. So it's really no different. Again, in practical application, you're not going to be using the formulas for these. You can if you really want to, but it is quite time consuming. You'll notice if you scroll down our list here, below the functions you're probably familiar with, like Z interval and T interval, you have a two sample Z interval and a two sample T interval. Also, proportion intervals. So just for fun, let's go back to one of the proportion questions from the beginning of the first video on two sample inferences. And we're going to use a two proportion Z interval here. So if you wanted to do an interval for this case, I'm going to go ahead and fill in my information. So this is a throwback to a few videos back. And let's just say, for the sake, I didn't give a confidence level, so let's use the 90% that's already there. So what would the confidence interval look like for something like this if you were interested? Right. So we can be 90% confident. And you'll see here we have that the proportion is between roughly 4% and 20% of everybody who has some type of result about that. So again, the choice is yours, how you wish to approach something like this. But keep in mind, you can just use technology to calculate confidence intervals or anything of that sort. Thanks for watching.